joining today. Spot Spotlight on the standards of fifth grade. And we are very excited um, to have you join us today. And we want to thank you for giving up a day of your summer break. We know that you've had just a incredibly exhausting year. And um, we are so happy to be working with you today. So um, my name is Tammy Waller, and I am the director of K-12 Social Studies and World and Native Languages at the Arizona Department of Education. I'm going to have my sixth year anniversary in two weeks at the Department of Ed. And prior to that, I taught 23 years um, in the uh, school system in Arizona, social studies, um, mostly seventh through 12th grade. And I'm gonna turn it over to Linda to introduce herself. Hello everyone, my name is Linda Burroughs and I am the K-12 Social Studies and World and Native Languages Specialist here at the Department of Education. And I am very happy to have you guys here today for another one of our summer seminar series for fifth grade. So thank you for coming. And I will let Heather introduce herself real quick. Hi everybody, my name is Heather Mall. I'm the co-coordinator of the Arizona Geographic Alliance. We're partnering and helping out the ADE. And um, towards the end of today, I'm gonna to show you guys some lessons that you can use take back to your classroom. Um, we're an organization that helps teachers include more geography in their classrooms. Excellent. And um, let's go ahead and look at the agenda today. So we are going to review the fifth grade Arizona history and social science standards uh, with ADE, that's Linda and I. Then we'll take a break and uh, the last half of the training is with Heather and the Arizona Geographic Alliance, which has amazing lessons and really show the intersection um, between geography and history, geography and civics, geography and economics, uh, really exciting stuff that we're um, really lucky to partner with. So when you leave here, you'll have um, a set of ready to go uh, resources that you can use with your students between what Linda and um, Heather and I will share with you today. And then um, we're gonna go ahead and do a poll. And um, this poll is um, in the chat, correct? Oh, no, it's not. We, we just got high tech. It. We just launched yes. it. So we just want to get a pulse of um, how familiar you feel with the standards. So if you could take a minute to go ahead and um, answer the poll. Okay, getting there, I've got about 88%. Okay, so we'll go ahead and end the polling and share the results. So it looks like um, most of the people in the room know the standards a little. We have a few who know them well or don't know the standards, maybe changing grade levels or coming in new. And then um, you have a, um, a group that is comfortable with the standards. And that's really great because um, what Linda and I and Heather hope to achieve by the end of this training is we hope to move you up a little bit. So if you don't know the standards, we hope when you leave today, you will know and understand the standards. If you know them a little, we wanna increase your knowledge and comfort and um, resources. If you're comfortable, we wanna give you some new tools to use um, with your classroom. And if you know the standards well, then some ideas and some tools to help you expand upon that knowledge. And then our learning goals today are to become familiar with the, with the fifth grade uh, 2018 history and social science standards, examine the major shifts in the standards and how they'll affect curriculum and instruction. We're gonna participate in a lot of model lessons and we're gonna ask you to be interactive with us today and put on a, a student perspective and a teacher hat. And then we're also going to examine resources and training available to you. Um, what I'd like you to do right now though is thank you, Susan, um, for uh, reminding me is I would love you to um, introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, let us know maybe where you, um, where you uh, uh, teach. Um, and um, I assume most of us are either fifth grade teachers or maybe multi-grade or district specialists. This will help us with uh, attendance because at the end we'll take the attendance and we'll look at the chat. So we'll ask you to do this in the beginning and the end of training. This is great. We have people from all over, which is exciting. Yuma, Marana, Gilbert, lots of different schools. Excellent. So while you guys are doing that, um, I'm going to go ahead and continue. Um, so 
we're going to start out with the why of social studies. Why is it important to really advocate for the teaching of social studies in your fifth grade classroom, even though you might get pressure maybe with that year um, of, of strange teaching to maybe spend more time on other topics, uh, we wanna talk, talk to you about why um, social studies is important. So you should see an infographic on the screen right now. And this infographic was created a few years ago. It's on the marginalization of social studies. And it was done by the Council for Chief State School Officers Social Studies Group, which are um, where all the superintendents um, come together. And um, I'd like you to take a second to look at this um, infographic. And in the chat, um, type something you see in that infographic that really made an impact on you. It could have surprised you. It could have, caused, uh, it could have been something that you really clicked with. But take a minute to look at it and, um, and go ahead and uh, type something into the chat. Seen lots of great, great um, um, information in the chat. I'm seeing um, a lot of people talking about the the two subjects that seem to uh, get the least amount of uh, time in elementary school are science and social studies. Um, I see people talking about um, that idea that um, we don't have students who are proficient in civics currently. I see a lot of people talking about um, the idea of uh, reading and social studies and that idea that um, content knowledge is important and social studies content knowledge makes poor readers better readers. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and I see some um, individuals uh, looking at this idea of how um, teaching social studies creates students who are more civically engaged. Um, they vote and discuss politics at home. They're more likely to volunteer and they're more confident in their ability to speak. Yes, time dedicated decreased after no child left behind. Yep, the nation at risk report probably uh, was the thing that doomed it. So let's talk a little bit about why social studies marginalization is so um, detrimental, especially to, I think a lot of you will get um, pressure from, I, I have a family of four uh, elementary school teachers in my family. And um, they always feel the pressure to uh, push things like social studies aside because of the uh, high stakes testing that happens um, with their students. And um, one of the things we wanna share with you is this idea that it is really important to not push social studies aside, especially if you want your reading scores to go up. So this is the, um, the NAEP, the National um, Assessment um, on Reading. And it talks about how um, our students are stagnating. Um, we've been given the NAEP and for the past 30 years, um, and I, I'm kind of thinking that this is around the No Child Left Behind um, point, for the past, um, for, for the past um, almost 30 years, uh, our scores have like been kind of flatlined and even going down a little bit, but we're spending more and more time teaching ELA. We're spending more and more time in pullout programs for doing um, intervention. We're spending more and more money in our school districts on programs to teach skills, but reading scores are not going up. So a lot of researchers have looked at that question and they've said, well, why is that? And what they've come up with, and, and this is a, a, a group of uh, researchers, literacy researchers, um, who have uh, talked about that at the same time that reading scores began to flatline, uh, social studies and other um, core knowledge or other core uh, content like 
science and, and arts began to decrease. And there's a critical connection between social studies and literacy success because you need background knowledge. And there's several studies, and we're not going to go over each study because um, we don't have the time to do that, but we do a separate training on that um, that um, you can share with um, your administrators. But these studies, um, like Daniel Willingham did a study on baseball where he showed that content background knowledge is more important um, when it comes to scoring on high stakes tests than reading ability. And he looked at students who had high content knowledge, but low um, comprehension and students that had high comprehension, but low background knowledge. And the students scored better when they had high background knowledge and low comprehension than the other students. So it's essential. Natalie Wexler uh, wrote The Knowledge Gap, and she's been talking about the fact that you need to have context and meaning to words to understand, e to understand everything, but especially the reading passages. Right now, um, they're reviewing the reading passages for the next um, you know, elementary high stakes test. And um, one, of the, one of the things that we know is that a large percentage of the questions, the, the readings that the students answer the prompts to, the prompts come from um, social studies. Leslie and Recht did a study that talked about if you give um, 60 high quality um, uh, literacy rich social studies lessons, second graders increase their scores significantly on their reading exams. And then the Fordham study, which we'll talk about, which is the most recent study and Nell Duke. So I love no love Nell Duke. She is um, she is um, has a project called Project Place, and she really looks at the connection between literacy and content knowledge. And she talks about kids are getting to fourth grade with the ability to read words. Right, they're doing really good at decoding words, um, but they don't have the world knowledge necessary to comprehend what it means. They don't have the background knowledge authors assume that they would have. And we've linked a really great video of her. Um, she is an incredible um, speaker, and um, and kind of showing her, her research that um, you'll get a copy of this presentation with all the links active for everything we do. Um, absolutely, um, and Andrea, supported by Wexler's The Knowledge Gap. And then I wanna show you the Fordham study because this just came out. And this was the first time some, um, and researchers looked at time. So what does time spent on course subjects have to do with reading comprehension scores. And they found things that they really didn't realize um, they would find. So we know elementary students spend more time in the US on ELA than any other subject. That's not new. We know students from less affluent backgrounds, Hispanic students and those attending public schools, traditional and charter, spend more classroom time on ELA than other students. A lot of that has to do with the high stakes testing. But what we didn't know is that increased instruction time in social studies, not ELA, is the only content area that is associated with significant improvement in reading ability. So if you look at the um, graph at the, of the Fordham study, it looked at more instructional time devoted to social studies is correlated with greater reading growth from first through fifth grade. And it looked at the percentage of um, reading test score improvement for um, 30 additional minutes of daily instruction in the following content areas. ELA, not much. Math, a little bit more. Non-core subject areas like arts, um, not much. Science, not much, actually a little decrease. But social studies, 15%, 15% standard of deviation. So social studies is that, that content area that significantly increases um, greater reading growth. But it's one of the first areas to be taken out of the classroom. And we're gonna really share with you great ways to infuse the social studies into literacy. And then I love number four because it says students who benefit the most from the additional social studies time are girls, those from lower income and non-English speaking homes. So sometimes we talk about our ELL students and English proficiency, but social studies content actually helps students who come from non-English speaking homes increase their reading scores. And then finally, um, many of you are familiar with Timothy Shanahan's research. And um, some of the things that we noticed in his research that really supported this idea of social studies um, is uh, what students read matters. So if you have an option in your um, of giving students something that has 
content knowledge to read, um, that, that really does matter. Um, that reading multiple texts on a topic is important. And that's one of the things in our state, state social studies standards is uh, reading different types of material from different perspectives and viewpoints. Uh, context is a must. We have to teach we have to give students context, and one of the ways to build that context, especially according to Natalie Wexler, is through social studies content. And then he talks about this reading block, that, that the reading block um, really needs to be looked at in ways to mix it up and break it up and have bring in some social studies um, content reading and um, and, and skill development into the reading block. And then write, and in social studies, we write, 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 just like ELA often and in all areas. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Linda right now, but um, hopefully when knowing this information will help you advocate to keep your social studies time. Great, thank you, Tammy. So we're going to do a Jamboard and we want to see what you guys think. If you go ahead and click on that link in the chat. Um, and what this is, is this is just a Jamboard. If you haven't used one before, go ahead and just you go right on out there. On the left hand side is a toolbar and the uh, let's see fourth one down is a sticky note and you can click on that sticky note. And that will allow you to um, put your ideas on there and then you can drag and drop it. And what we want to know is what do you think are the skills and dispositions that students need to be successful, both in college and career because we're preparing our kids for both. And this was really the idea that we set out when we began writing the standards, what was it, in 2016. So um, I'd like for you to think a minute, what kind of thinking skills do students need? What kind of communicating skills do they need? Um, and what kind of reading skills? And you can uh, go ahead and jump on there. I see some people are already putting some great ideas on there. Ability to problem solve, that's huge. Comprehension is a must. Oh, I like the analyzing primary sources. Wonderful, creativity and innovation. Yep, that's a good one too. Oh, being able to annotate and cite evidence from articles, that's perfect. Oh, I like the ability to be clear and concise. That's a really good one. Oh, you guys have got some great. Oh, disagreeing respectfully and listening with an, listening with an open mind, critically evaluating information. Oh, real life connection. I think that's a huge one. Why study history? You know, who cares what happened to people that died, you know? 200 to 2000 years ago, right? We wanna know how that relates to our students today. So it's really important to keep that in mind. So oh, Linda, advocating for your own ideas is good too. Yeah, Tammy. If some of you, um, I can't project the Jamboard because uh, we've reached our max. Um, if you can't get in the Jamboard, you can put it in the chat. Yes, yeah, please do. Please put it in the chat. Do you want to share the Jamboard to show everyone or? Um, I can, let's see. You have to stop sharing your screen. I stopped. Oh, so yeah, too many people are viewing it. Yes, um, sometimes Jamboard can be picky. Let's see. Oh, can you share? Hold on here. Uh, let me see. Share. We'll share screen too. There we go. Oh, I see your attendance. Oh, wrong thing. Stop sharing. <laughs> Why don't we just share and we'll go back to it. Okay, great. That'll just be easier. And we, we will download, one of the great things about Jamboard is you can download it and save it and we'll send it as part of our follow-up email for you guys so you mm -hmm. can see what uh, your peers have written. Okay. Yeah, some other great ideas are ability to truly listen, um, organizing your thoughts, putting them in writing, uh, relating to local context. I think that's another great one. That's perfect. So yeah, why don't you advance to the next slide, Tammy, we can go on. So we asked ourselves the same thing. It's like when we started the standards, what is it that people need to be able to do to, you know, students need to be successful and they need to be able to think uh, analytically, right? And I'm not gonna read this for you, but the idea of posing and framing things, looking at ideas like continuity and change, cause and effect, and inferences are all part of, of analytical thinking that are, are important. Next slide. They also need to write, read, excuse me, widely and critically, right? We want our students to examine, interpret um, primary sources, which are just the same things you guys said, 
the ability to identify and compare, looking at some, uh, secondary sources and discerning sub subtext. So all of the same things you guys are looking at as problem solving. And lastly, we want students to communicate cogently, right? We want evidence-based arguments. We want them to look at multiple perspectives, um, different kinds of evaluations and making uh, constructive arguments. So Sam Weinberg has two quotes that I think really sum up our standards extraordinarily well. And he wrote this book on why learn history when it's already on your phone, right? Our students can look anything up on Google. So it's very easy for them to really look at this idea of, you know, what do we, what are standards and how we want to prepare our students. And his quote is that our job is not to give kids the answers, but our job is to give them the problems to solve and then the tools that they need to solve them. And that's truly what our standards are, you know, about. Next slide. So when we came up with the new standards, keeping in mind those ideas of reading and um, thinking and speaking or communicating cogently, right? We had to do some shifts and changes and we're gonna get into those. So what are some of the shifts and changes? First, we went from a real clear progression of standards, building as students in kindergarten, as their ideas and abilities and um, view of the world grows and expands, so do the standards. So we start with just little communities and then get into um, up to like second grade where it's all about the world around them, building to Arizona. And so we had that clear progression as opposed to one of the big, can you go back a slide please? Um, go back, so the clear progression, so where we have, where it's all about, you know, just all over the place, that kind of hodgepodge. We also started with um, a real um, anchor standards, which are different. Can you go back a slide? So the anchor standards, which are these overarching umbrella standards, which Tammy's going to go into in a minute. And then we have great specific standards underneath that. We also included inquiry as the focus and then also the skill complexity. So by the time the students come to you in fifth grade, they will have had and practiced a lot of these skills and discipline, um, disciplines um, thinking before they get to you. Go I, ahead apolo and slide. I apologize, my mouse is um, skipping. I apologize. Wonky. Yep, no it is wonky. So the, the, the shifts also required in order to make that kind of progression smoothless as opposed to the complaint that we had where the standards were all over the place was we had to move some things around. One, regardless of how you study or the content that you study of history, it's all the same. We also needed to have economics be more of a focus in all the grade levels. So that way students were financially fit by the time they graduated high school. So that does require you to teach some economic concepts and skills, which there are plenty of resources out there that you have ready to made lessons that are student-centered inquiry-based that will give you um, at the end. We also had to move some content around, um, again, to meet that progression, moving Arizona studies from fourth grade to third grade. And then also again, too, to free up time in fifth grade, we moved that colonial content into fourth grade. So that way in fifth grade, you guys start really with the American Revolution. The rest of the standards are really for high school. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Tammy. Okay, so what we wanna to talk to you a little bit about is the structure of the new standards. Um, and um, how, to, uh, how to use them. So I love Sam Weinberg, uh, just like Linda does. And Sam Weinberg talks about um, the mind demanding patterns and form, which build up slowly and require repeated passes, with each pass going deeper and probing further. And um, that was something that was really important to us when we created the new standards. And that's why we created them with an anchor standard approach, similar to ELA in math and now the new science standards, because we want students to do these skills and development um, from kindergarten all the way through to 12th grade, uh, becoming more complex in what they end up doing. So we used to have a system called uh, of standards, it was POs, and there were hundreds of people, places, and events in every single grade level. And it was just like a checklist, and it was overwhelming, it was unconnected, <laughs> Excuse me. And it did something what I like to call drive by social studies teaching, uh, where you're going from like Plato to NATO in a year, you don't really have time to, uh, to look at things. And many times, um, what we heard in our feedback from our elementary teachers is they just 
couldn't do it based upon what they had and they just didn't do many of the standards so students were, weren't really getting the standards so when i think about the po's i think about my daughter's bedroom closet and it looks like this it's just a bunch of things thrown in a big pile and there's no order structure semblance to them and uh, you really have to work hard to uh, to pull out an outfit and even determine if your laundry is clean um, what the new standards do is they organize things like I wish her closet looked um, so you can really see how things can um, apply to each other match together um, and you really have this um, this um, order that makes sense, the structure that makes sense. So let's take a little look at it. Oops. Um, so the new standards are focused on inquiry and questions broad to allow flexibility at the local level. So there's um, course considerations that say, you know, you could, to teach this big idea, but you could use different types of examples to, to teach it. Uh, and it shows a progression of skills and topics from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. It's not like um, uh, the old standards where you just like, it was really at that I, um, lower level of blooms and DOK one and two, and you taught it, you were done. You taught it, you were done. Um, what they're not, they're not a checklist uh, to memorize. We give you um, suggestions for what would fit into the standards and the content, but really you have freedom to bring in other examples. They're not inflexible and they're really easy to integrate with ELA, science, and even math concepts. And they, um, they don't stand alone. They're integrated within each other. You use your skills and processes and your, um, and your content standards. So this is what they look like. We have what's called the course considerations. And that's just an overview of what typically would be taught in the, in the fifth grade. Like what's that umbrella of content that it covers? Disciplinary skills and processes, that's what we want students to be able to do with history and geography. Um, uh, it's really your um, economics and political science. It's your um, inquiry skills, it's your chronology, your ability to look at multiple perspectives. You have civics content standards at fifth grade, economics content standards, geography content standards, and history content standards. And these work together to create units. So you're teaching a little bit of, um, within your unit, you're teaching history, geography, skills, um, civics, economics, and even um, you can connect it to your ELA content very easily. And what we did is we use the anchor standards, which are the skills all students should have mastered by the time they graduate. So we have 21 anchor standards across um, five different categories. And every student does not learn every anchor standard at every grade level, but by each grade band, students hit all anchor standards. By the time they get to eighth grade and seventh grade, they really are doing most of them. Um, and then um, some of them, every every grade level does um and and, and at every um in every course and um this is the end result in your grade specific standards you'll have this sp1 broken down into like a, a fifth grade level um and uh your civic standards into fifth grade level etc and then we have a personal finance standard under economics, which is new. Um, according to state legislation, uh, financial literacy needs to be taught uh, from the K-12 um, uh, progression. So here's what it looks like in terms of your storylines. Uh, we start out with children as citizens in kindergarten, and then we move to the communities, world around us in second grade. Then in third grade, students are focusing on Arizona studies. Fourth grade, they're looking at regions and cultures of the Americas, uh, pre-contact um, to European settlement. That's why they're doing colonialism. Fifth grade, your content didn't change significantly in terms of what it is. It did change maybe in how you might teach it. Um, and it's, it's um, United States studies. Then sixth grade goes global. Seventh grade is integrated where we bring the global and the US together and eighth grade, puts it all into this idea of citizenship and civic engagement. And now that I know this, what do I do with it? Let's give you an example. 
um, of the vertical articulation. So we took two anchor standards. Um, we took a skills and process standard and a geography standard. Um, and we took these two because these are taught in every single grade level. So the anchor standard of chronological reasoning talks about understanding the process of change and continuity over time and assessing similarities and differences between historical periods past and present. So a first grader would uh, learn chronology, place important life events on a timeline. By fifth grade, students are gonna use and create chronological sequences of related events to compare developments that happened at the same time. Seventh grade, they go broader and they analyze big events. And in eighth grade, they evaluate how these events and developments were shaped by their historical period. Anchor standard for geography number one, the use of geographical representations and tools helps individuals understand their world. So in first grade, they're using and constructing maps and graphs and other geographic representations because the technology moves very quickly. Um, and there's all sorts of ways they can do this of familiar and unfamiliar places um, in the world. And then they locate physical and human features. And in fifth grade, they're gonna use these skills focusing on change in the United States. Seventh grade, they're going to look at spatial patterns of culture and environmental characteristics. And by high school, they're going to use this geographic data to explain things, to, to make claims. Could you lock your window? Okay. So is this you or me, Linda? I can't hear you, you're muted. I think it's someone, a participant. So I'm gonna see if I can just mute them. Go ahead. Oh. Okay, so um, what we'd like you to do is we'd like you to um, to pull up uh, the fifth grade standards and Linda's going to put the link in the chat because we've created these little one to two pagers, which put all your standards in one place. So pull this up and then we'd like you to um, think about what you notice and what you wonder. So Linda, can you put the link to the... Yeah. Or actually, if I click on it, I can just put it right yeah, there. Yeah, I got it here. Hold on. Oh, second. I just did it. That's cool. There we go. Okay, so this is your fifth grade um, uh, course considerations at the top, and then it has all your standards for you in one place. So we'd like you to take a look at your fifth grade um, standards, and on the Jamboard, um, we want you to uh, put what you notice. And then what do you wonder? What questions do you have? What do you notice? What do you wonder? And again, if you can't get into the Jamboard, um, then we ask that you put it in the chat. To get to this other page on the Jamboard, up at the top, you'll see a little um, white rectangle box that says one of four, and then an arrow. If you arrow over, that will take you to the new uh, Jamboard page. That is blank. There we go. Looks like Jamboard has a 50 person maximum right now, which is kind of new. I don't remember that being there before. We've got some people starting to answer. I can't project their answers. I can't get in the Jamboard. Oh, you, did you try the link? Yeah, it says there's too many people in the Jamboard. Oh, okay, that's why. Yeah, so I don't know if you can pull up the Jamboard. Let me see if that. I can try that again here. I'm gonna stop sharing while people are putting things in the Jamboard. Let's see here. I moved my screen around to see if that would help it. There we go. Yes. Are you seeing it? Yes. Okay, perfect. This is great. And a lot of times your, your post-its will come up at the top and you just drag them down. Yeah, Angela, definitely notice that 45 minute social studies lesson per day and you don't have much time. Um, we're gonna address that about how it really is beneficial to kind of combine, you know, which gets into Shanahan's research about combining social studies and ELA, where that way then you're not 
dividing the minutes so starkly that everything becomes more combined and that does help pull everything together. Yeah, definitely, Stacey, then the historical fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, economics is, is a real scary thing because for most of people didn't take an economics class in um, high school or I mean in college. And so what we've got is there are a couple of really good resources. We have another local resource like the Geographic Alliance, the Arizona Council on Economic Education that does a lot of trainings for elementary teachers. We have another training coming up from EverFi that is on economics through fourth through eighth grade. That is next week that you guys might be interested in. Um, signing up for. And then there's also a great website, which I will include with you guys called um, uh, Econ EdLink. And they also have the pre-made lessons that make it very easy to go through. And um, I see a lot of the economics questions up here, but you remember you can do those in the context of teaching um, early America or westward expansion. What are the risks that people took when they decided to move west? What were the risks people took when they declared independence? What are some of the economic issues involved with declaring independence and the revolution? So when you look at the um, standards, you you integrate them in to to what content area you're, you're teaching. And then if you're looking at um, financial economics and things like that, you might be able to put part of it into a math lesson, which we're working with our new math director and specialist to look at how we can integrate social studies into mathematics. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing so we can get moving yes, on. to the next. So lots of great ideas and lots of good questions and, and we'll um, try and address these wonders. Um, so this is now me turning it over to, um, oh, I have to share, you didn't see that, um, turning it over to Linda. Um, I'm, oh, I'm just having trouble finding my share button because I'm getting all these messages from the Teams meeting. Okay, you're muted, Linda. So Arizona is part of the, or I mean, fifth grade is part of the three through five grade band where, you know, you'll hit some of those anchor standards through that. And you're kind of the culminating side to it with, with Arizona studies. Can you go to the next slide? Yes. So as you looked at your standards with the storylines for the course considerations, those bulleted lists at the top. So that is really the content that we recommend makes a full and robust study of social studies at a fifth grade level. And so we do start at the American Revolution, um, going on with things like the constitution and principles of the government. Um, you've got immigration in there as a big piece of it, um, looking at the different cultural and ethnic groups, um, responsibilities of citizens as the new nation starts and voting. Um, becomes a part of it. You're also doing some disciplinary skills with, uh, you know, primary and secondary sources, looking at founding documents, um, uh, historical figures and, and people and all different kinds of things. And then, so that's your content and that's what you're building your units around. And we really advocate incorporating ELA and social studies. So that way you're doing, doing killing two birds with one stone, working smarter, not harder. And you're doing different things like chronological reasoning and uh, different things of that nature with economics and all that sort of stuff with constructing maps with geography, which Heather's got some great lessons to show you, as well as a lot of economics with that, you know, looking at, like Tammy said, you know, what was the market economy? What were they selling at the beginning during the American Revolution? What was the, you know, economy of the Civil War kind of thing? So those are time periods that you would look at. Why did people move out west? Um, and what that did for the economy kind of thing. All right, next slide, please. So just to show you how these standards can kind of be translated into the classroom, if we take a disciplinary skill practice, like explain how the events of the past affect students' lives and society, you can turn that into what we call an I can statement, which makes it really easy for students to understand and also really how you know the, the unit finishes up. So students can say, I can learn about what life was like for families during the American Revolution, and how it is both the same and different compared to life today. So you're really hitting a lot of those standards just with that one I can statement too. Um, comparing information provided by multiple sources, you can ask questions about a picture and then um, using evidence to develop a claim about the past. 
students can say, I can find the main idea in a text about a historical person or event, which is exactly the same wording as the ELA standards, which gets me to our next slide. So when we wrote the standards three years ago, we very, very purposely tied them to ELA and uh, for this reason. So as we go through these um, anchor standards for social studies and ELA, I'm gonna ask you to reflect upon them. And so keep this in mind as we go through the next one. So when we look at reading standards for social studies and ELA, we ask in social studies to evaluate arguments and claims, looking at main ideas, comprehending complex texts, and also looking at multiple forms of media. In ELA, the wording is almost oh. word for word the same. It asks you to evaluate an argument, you're determining the main idea, you're interpreting phrases with the structure of the text, and you're identifying and evaluating text from diverse media. Then we, when we look at the writing standards for social studies, we, we ask students to write an argument using evidence. We ask them to tell stories. We ask them to apply appropriate technology. So we want diverse um, projects as they're coming out. It's not just about writing. And we also want them to gather multiple sources. In ELA, they're going to write arguments using reasoning and evidence. They're writing narratives, which are stories, right? They're also using technology to produce different types of media and different types of projects and using multiple sources. And then lastly, in our communicating anchor standards and social studies, we want students to collaborate with diverse partners. We want them to design and deliver presentations. We want them to present information that's not totally written in text. As we all know, kids are exposed to all different types of media today. And then we also want them to use multiple modes of those communications. And the ELA standards are exactly the same with that. And again, it's this idea that as you're creating these lessons, as you're creating these units, you're really teaching social studies and ELA all at the same time. And that's really the, the main message we hope you kind of come out of this today, that it's not something that you're gonna put away your reading, take out your social studies, it's all connected. Can you go to the next slide for me? All right, so now just in the chat, as we went through all these anchor standards for reading, writing, and communicating, um, what are some of the consistent uh, threads that you guys saw through um, that grade, the grade band there? And if you can type those into the chat for me. Communication, oral and written. Mm -hmm. Yeah, determining the main idea is the same. Kids are asked to research, right? Just because they're in fifth grade, it doesn't mean that they can't find the evidence and make a claim, right? And that's the same thing in ELA. So when your students are doing that, if you use maybe some of those social studies backgrounds and context, you're doing all those same things and you're doing both ELA and social studies at the same thing. Yeah, inference is very important in fifth grade. Yep, critical thinking main ideas, proving statements, exactly. So regardless of whether you're studying ELA or social studies, the great thing is, is you can use social studies to teach those ELA standards as well. And we'll show you where we have on our website, a crosswalk where we have taken the social study standards, the ELA standards and the ELP standards, if you have some English language learners, and combine them so that way you can justify and say, oh, well, I am teaching ELA even though it looks like I'm teaching social studies. So that's a great resource for you to have. And we'll show you where that is at the end of the, end of the session. And Marina, we will be sharing with you um, some really great uh, resources because I know uh, it's easily connected, but it's finding the quality materials that is difficult. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna to talk to you now about um, actual lessons and resources. And the first thing we're gonna do is uh, talk to you a little bit about inquiry because our new standards are based on this idea of inquiry. Um, and inquiry really is a process for student learning. And in inquiry, instead of telling students information, students um, have a process they go through where there's a compelling or a question. Uh, students look at uh, different resources. They evaluate those resources. They construct an answer to their question. And then they communicate 
their answer or their conclusion. And it can be something you do as a warm up. It can be something that you do as a unit. It can be a one day. It can be a three day. Um, inquiry is just a process. There's no one way to do it, but it's really centered on that idea of student curiosity and student centered. So let's take a little bit about what that might look like. So with the American Revolution, we, um, our old standards listed a bunch of people, places, events, and dates. And that was pretty much it. Identify the, you know, this, identify that. So the new standards build on the facts. Facts are important. You can't answer an inquiry without deep knowledge and, and, and facts to look at a larger picture. So what are some of the questions that you could use to invoke the creation of those facts through inquiry? What happens when cultures collide? How does personal freedom among individuals and groups significantly affect us today? What rights and responsibilities do different groups of people have leading up to the revolution? What's the balance between rights and responsibilities? What causes disagreements? How did the movement towards the revolution lead to the Declaration of Independence? How did the Revolutionary War impact the colonies' ability to rule themselves? What factors contribute to war? So these are more open-ended questions, uh, which really have some different perspectives and, um, and, and ways to, to go about answering them. So we are going to share with you a um, tool that we use for inquiry. Um, and we think it's a great tool, uh, kindergarten through 12th grade from the Library of Congress. And it is um, called Observe, Reflect, and Wonder. And um, it is a technique that the Library of Congress has teachers use with any type of source. Um, uh, it can be a, a picture, a cartoon, things like that. So we took a source from the American Revolution period and um, we are going to have you go through the process um, that students would go through of observing, reflecting, and wondering. So the first step of the process always starts out with observe. What do you see? So um, the question I'm gonna ask you to put in the chat is just as you look at the image, what do you see? Not what it means or what you think it means, but what, what, what do you see? And sometimes I have students like circle things. Um, if I give them a source, I'll put it in a, a clear sheet and give them a vis-a-vis -vis pen or a dry erase and say, circle what you see, the first five things you see. So we see chaos, uniforms, battle, uh, people being shot, two sides, shooting, guns, blood, a dog. I know I love that dog. Smoke. Okay. So you take students through that step and you have them work with partners or if you're using it with smaller students or younger students, you might have them say things out loud and write them down. Um, red, you see people in red coats shooting, guns. Okay. Buildings. Excellent. So you have them spend some time on what do you see. And sometimes you can even um, break the picture up into quarters or thirds and show them one piece of it at a time and have them add to it. After you look at what do you see, then you take students through a reflection question that you choose. So, oh, before we do that, one of the things you can do with students, especially at fifth grade, is you can show them two different images. So you already wrote what you saw in the first one. Then I would ask students, I'm going to show you a second picture now. Now tell me what you see. So look at the second picture. What do you see? Or even when you look at the two pictures side by side, what do you see? I might ask students, what, what's similar in the pictures? What's different? So you get some good conversation and, and some good observation with your students on the two sources. Um, and then you move to a reflection question. And it could be what's similar, what's different. Um, but the reflection question um, that we're asking is what do you think is happening or what do you think this is? I'm gonna put both pictures up. What do you think this is? 
And then I'll always ask students why. Well, why do you think it's the Boston Massacre? Why do you think, um, why do you think that it's um, people fighting? Why do you think it's military? Why do you think it's a revolt? And I, and I always ask them to keep giving me their reasoning behind it. Anarchy, battle, okay. Battle or revolt. And there's all sorts of different questions you could ask for your reflection question. Okay, so you think it's an important event because both pictures are at the same location. So maybe that same event and two people have decided to use it. And yeah, and I might ask you, well, why do you know it's the same event? What do you see that tells you that? Okay. And then, of course, you spend a little more time with students, but we can only give you a snack in, in our training because of time. And then the last part is that wonder. What questions do you still have? about this. And that's a great, great thing to talk about with students is what questions do you have? Because those questions then can become the basis for um, inquiry and lessons. So what questions do you still have? Who are these people? What caused the conflict? What are they fighting over? What was the outcome? Excellent. Tammy, before we go to the next slide, we'll put the Jamboard link in there and have them guess how many standards. How many standards? Use. Okay. Yeah. I might ask. Board. Yeah. Oh, oh go ahead. Link. No, I was going to say, I might ask. Um, I, I know students will notice that one of the persons is um, an African American, and they might say, well, why is one in one picture, but not the other? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, so if you go out to the Jamboard, or if you can't get into the Jamboard, you can type your answer into the chat. But if you go into the Jamboard and up at the top, if you arrow over to page three, you'll see there are a bunch of circles and a line 5, 10, and 20, just to show you a little different way of how to use Jamboard. And you can just grab a circle and move it to where uh, you think it is. So we've got Summit around 10. We've got some between 10 and 20. Yep, so how many standards? Than, yep. Couple less than 10. Okay. Should I share the answer? Let's see, I think people are still moving it around. Sorry, my Okay, I've got a 15 done. and a 10 in the chat. Yeah, it looks like the majority are moving like around 10, 11, 12, I think are the, the biggest ones. So yeah, why don't you do the big, uh, big reveal for us, Tammy? Okay, so this observe reflecting question, um, little activity that you could even do as a starter with your students, um, hits 17 social studies standards for fifth grade. And we've listed them right here. And it hits 13 ELA standards. And we've listed them right here. So maybe that question of how do I um, have time to do this is that idea that, you know, there's a lot of integration, a lot of bang with your buck. One activity can combine so many different standards together. And we call that bundling. 16, 20, excellent. So I think um, that this is you now, Linda. Yeah. So again, if you looked at those standards that we covered with the observe, reflect, and question activity from the Library of Congress, one, you can see that it can tie to any kind of activity, but you also see that it does a lot of the disciplinary skills and standards, as well as some economics, history standards as well. Um, and again, you're, you're teaching both at the same time. So we're gonna show you now another version or another form of inquiry that you can use in your classrooms. So this comes from what we call the c3teachers.org, which started as a national grant from the National Endowment, from the federal government, um, National Endowment of the Humanities to the state of New York. And it started for them to increase inquiry in their classrooms. Other states have now added to it. And the beautiful thing is that it is an open education resource, which means you can take it, you can use it, mash it up, only use a piece of it. You can use the whole inquiry. You can do whatever you want with it. And they are really student-centered, inquiry-based, and they've already excerpted many of their lessons for you to put them at a grade level. We do recommend, though, that you search by topic 
rather than grade level as just a little caveat because different states have submitted to this um, now database of these inquiries and some states will teach different topics at different grade levels. So I've shown this one, uh, chosen this one because it is one that you can use for fifth grade, which is great. And Kristen used some of these last year and that it's called the c3teachers.org. I'll put it in the chat here oh. so you have it already. Um, and, and so this is what it looks like. It's a little template and it always starts with some kind of compelling or overarching question that if you do the whole inquiry, the students should be able to answer at the end. And there's no necessarily right or wrong answer. This is where the students are picking the answer based upon the evidence and how they analyze the evidence. So it starts with an overarching question. In this case, it's how did, um, what did it take for women to be considered equal to men in New York? And so the next slide, please. So we start with staging the question. So in this case, you would start by having your students participate in the discussion of what it means to be equal. So when we talk about women's rights, when we talk about, um, you know, the Seneca Falls Convention, you know, it really starts with this discussion with your students of what it means to be equal. Sometimes the staging the question can be like a picture that you did a, a observe, reflect, and question activity with it. Um, in this case, it's just a discussion. All right, so next, after you stage the question and then get the kids interested in it, then you really start with kind of a scaffolding or the, they call them supporting questions. And an inquiry will have anywhere between three to four supporting or scaffolding questions. And each one of these individual questions has primary sources with it, formative tasks with it that will ultimately help the students answer that summative, summative question. So supporting question number one. Oh, whoops, can you go back, please? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Supporting question number one is who had voting rights in the state of New York when the United States was founded? And so in this case, they have an excerpt from the Declaration of Independence. So you're getting that foundation document, right? And then you also have an excerpt from the New York State Convention. And then once you have the kids read and annotate these, which are hitting both ELA and social study standards, the formative task is next, that they're going to list or do just a list of requirements for voting in the state of New York. Then you go on to supporting question number two, what were the social roles of women in New York before the 20th century? So in this case, they give you an image from um, social roles of women. So you've got another primary source here, and, looking at, and you're also now looking at the 14th and 15th amendments to the constitution. And the formative task for this one is to write a paragraph of women's roles in society before the 20th century. And then the last supporting question is how did women move from the home to the political stage in New York? And so in this case, you have an image of Susan B. Anthony in the women's rights movement. And you also have them analyzing the 19th amendment to the US constitution. And the formative task for this one is to make a claim about how women gained the right to vote in New York. So you do all three of these formative tasks, and then that leads you to the summative performance task. And in this case, this inquiry specifically is asking you to construct an argument that addresses the compelling question using specific claims. And then you can extend that further by having them address the compelling question with um, making, constructing that argument, right? And using specific claims and evidence from say the 19th amendment or the 14th or 15th amendment. The nice thing about the C3 teachers is it also gives you an opportunity or a suggestion for taking informed action. So again, this is that relating it to kids. Why well, learn about something 200 years ago, who cares? Or even hundred years ago, how does it relate to me today? So this would be a great way that maybe you can look at the data of the number of Americans who voted in the last election, brainstorm ideas about the importance of one's right to vote, um, creating a public service announcement to in, um, promote the right to vote, sending a video um, to a local radio station. You can do all sorts of like kids voting things that I know my own children loved doing kids voting um, in their elementary schools. And so there are lots of ways that you can take this, hey, these are a bunch of old people who cares, how do we apply it today to voting and it's obviously it's in the news and everything. And that's a great way to kind of get your kids um, involved in this. So again, with the C3, Oops. we can ah. do, um, just go ahead and go back. There we I go. Did. 
With the C3, you can do all of the inquiry and take a few days doing it. You can do part of it if you only have a little snippet or time that you can do. That's what's great. And you can also combine ones to make it more focused for your um, students in your community too, which is really nice to, as well. So again, if we go back out to the Jamboard, we've got one more. If you arrow over to page four, let's guess how many standards were covered in this inquiry. I'll put the Jamboard link again. And if you don't have access, we can uh, again type it. So we've got some 20, some 15s. We've got our circles moving definitely on the higher end with this one. Well. Yeah, we've got anywhere from 12 to 20 looking on the Jamboard. So I like doing this and this can be like, Jamboard is a great thing that you could do like an agree to dis disagree thing. So you could do that bar and hey, move your bubble over here if you agree or disagree. If you're in the classroom, it's really nice to just have the kids line up in your classroom on one end. Hey, you agree with this statement or you disagree with the statement, you can like evaluate the validity of claims that way and get a visual. Um, but this is a great way to do it online, especially with, you know, classes. So in this case, we covered 19 standards for this one inquiry, if you did the whole inquiry. And if you notice the standards here, these are the fifth grade history standards. And again, you're using those standards multiple times. And so the standards that you used for Tammy's observe, reflect, and question activity, you're using those same standards again. And that gets to that Sam Weinberg quote with the repeated pass over and over and over again, our students are going to delve deeper into it and become better at it. And so we use 19 social study standards. And in this inquiry, we covered 15 ELA standards. So this is a great example, again, of working smarter, not harder, right? Don't get so tied up and, oh, I did this many minutes and this many minutes of this. Combine them all together. Use that crosswork to justify it to the teacher, to your principal, um, and also use the research as well, which we know this just is better for the kids, right? They're getting all of this as, as one. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tammy. Okay. Um, oh, wait, so we've got one more. One more. Sorry. It's C3. Okay. So I actually went through the C3 and found a whole bunch of the inquiries that are there that relate to um, teaching fifth grade. So this way, this they are constantly adding new ones. So this list will be outdated in a few months. But for now, these are all great inquiries that I hyperlinked. So that way you can go directly straight to them. So when you receive this PDF in a couple of days with the registration um, with your um, attendance completed, um, you'll get this and you can link out straight to them. So that saves you guys some time. So I went ahead and did that. And now I'm gonna um, turn it over to Tammy. Great, um, so I just wanna address Andrea said, thinking of including all these standards into my lesson plan is mind bending. I don't think you have to list every single standard in your lesson plan that mm -hmm. your, your lesson will, will pick. I, I would say focus on maybe a skills and process and a content standard just for the purpose of, of, of writing that lesson plan. But I think, the, I think that there's a multiplicity of standards that would apply. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you would have to list. I mean, I, I would hope you wouldn't have to list everything. Um, but yeah, just pick one from, from skills and processes, one from, um, from content, content area. You could also um, do it by unit too, for mm -hmm. example. Like, hey, these are the, for this unit, these are the skills and processes and economics and history standards that we're going to focus on. Um, we just wanted to show you that there is this ability to hit multiple standards mm -hmm. with just one lesson. But yeah, if you have to do that for every single lesson, that would get pretty, pretty daunting. And I don't know that I would be really happy with my well, admin if they made me do that. Yeah, but Regina, Regina that, that's really interesting. She said listing mm -hmm. them would be a great way to show admin how important social studies is. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Good point. It's true. Um, okay, so I want to share with you one of my favorite sources um, to get really high quality um, material. And this is um, called History's Mysteries. 
and it is from um, the Library of Congress. So it's a very strongly vetted source using the collections in the Library of Congress. And it's and it's only and it's set up for for, for kindergarten through fifth grade. So if you have um, peers at your school and they're like, I don't know where to get something, you know, with this for my second grade students, um, the the um, the site is set up um, just it's just for you guys for for elementary teachers written by elementary teachers and librarians from the Library of Congress. So history's mysteries is a great way to uh, to do little um, inquiries, but because um, kids love a mystery and they love being detectives, it's all framed as you're a detective and you're solving this historical mystery. And um, the, the history mysteries um, starts out with a really great introductory lesson. And for fourth and fifth grade, um, it's on what do historians do? So students understand that process of what is a historian. It's kind of fun sometimes to ask them, what do you think historians do? And they're like, read books or something. Or um, and, then you and then they really learn like that they are actually detectives and investigators and, and they solve things. And, and that's really fun. So um, some of the history mysteries that we thought were really um, would be good for the um, the fifth grade is they have um, one on um, the um, uh, slavery and which is part of part of the standards and it talks about um, how did uh, Kosula Kujo Lewis and other enslaved persons experience the Atlantic world and there's a little unit summary for the teacher and then um, there's mystery number one and mystery number two mystery number three chemistry number four, and you can do all four of them within your unit, or you can choose like, hey, I think I just want to talk about like how slavery and and how, oh, that is so interesting, Andrea, you just read about him this morning. I, I always wish there was like this way that you could click something and it would pronounce it because I always get nervous and I'm pronouncing things wrong. Um, so it you could do one of them, like look at, you know, the middle passage or why is it important to learn about the history of slavery and freedom today, um, that type of thing, which um, is, is important. Um, another one is what is free speech and why does it matter? So what is free speech? Does it mean I can just say whatever I want? And then what can I say in school? And this makes it applicable to them looking at the Mary Beth Tinker case um, that um, established student and teacher free speech rights in school. And then why do many people celebrate the 4th of July? This is one of my favorites because it talks about, you know, that idea of the 4th of July and the Declaration of Independence, but it also talks about why would someone refuse to celebrate the 4th of July? And it's got Frederick Douglass's um, uh, really great piece about uh, what is the 4th of July to a slave. And it's, and, and then you could talk maybe about, um, you know, uh, that idea of, of, of um, those multiple perspectives. So I love History's Mysteries. It's phenomenal. Um, and it's really, they have some video tutorials for teachers. They have video PD for teachers. Um, and um, and it, it uses really good best practices. Oh yeah, equal um, Brian Stevens, Equal Justice, excellent. Um, iCivics, um, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with iCivics. When we think about iCivics, we think about the games, right? They have these great games on civics, but iCivics also has other stuff. And they started um, these um, this DB, DB Quest, which is looking at um, primary sources and inquiry questions. So some of the um, really great DB Quests that they have, and this is all free, it's all open education resources. For iCivics, you sign up for a, um, uh, you sign up for an account because everything has strings attached when you're when you're using um, when you get grants and all of this stuff comes from grants from uh, and when you have grants you have to like show that people are using the materials so when you sign in and you open something they know they can say uh, we have people in Arizona who are using this so we should continue doing it please fund us um, type of thing yes yeah, so we're going to have a break in um, in just a few minutes um, so. So the, um, the le lessons that you can use in DB Quest, um, DC voting rights, and you can use the American Revolution as an example because in DC they're talking about taxation without representation. So how does that idea apply today? Uh, the Louisiana Purchase, the Preamble, Historical Monuments and Meanings, Hamilton and the National Bank, co the Constitution's cover letter, and Cherokee Resistance. These are all DB Quests that um, would be applicable to the fifth grade standards and to the um, to the content area. 
And then finally, the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress is amazing. Um, they have such incredible resources, but don't just go to the Library of Congress and, and uh, search for something. You will just give up and be overwhelmed. They have an amazing teacher page set up for teachers to launch into some different things. So they have a wonderful resource on how do you even use primary sources? I want to start using them. Where do I get them? How do I use them? Then they have the Teaching with Primary Sources um, materials, where they uh, look at issues like they have um, they have really great primary source sets. So if you're teaching slavery, the Library of Congress already has a teacher set put together, which has different primary source documents from their collection on slavery, immigration, maps, poetry, presidents, industry. And um, they have uh, this teacher with primary sources site um, sends out um, lesson plans to teachers. There's a blog and they cover like elementary uh, use of primary sources and things like that. And then I'm going to turn it over to Linda. All right, we have one more inquiry that we want to show you as an example. Before we do that, let's go ahead and take just a quick five minute break, grab some more coffee. Um, I'm going to pause the recording. All right, so welcome back, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. So we have one more inquiry to show you, but before we go any further, we wanted to talk about uh, what native uh, um, I can't even think of it right now, what native resources we had out there for you. And so the Smithsonian Museum um, in Washington, DC has what's called Native Knowledge 360 as a website. And they have some great lessons, inquiry-based lessons out there for you to go through. They also have online exhibits that apply. And so these are just a couple of them, a uh, few of them that apply to, that would be great for our fifth grade um, standards. So we've got the Indian removal, the Trail of Tears, and the Navajo Treaty of 1868. And so these, again, are all hyperlinked. You'll get them um, in there when you see this, but they're also great inquiry lessons. Next slide, please. We also have some other Native resources for you. One is Seventh Generation Games, which is a great way that's kind of gaming and talking about Native Americans um, and some of their history and what, what um, they are today. Uh, we've also got a link out to Native American children's literature, which again, if you want to buy books for your school or if your librarians like, hey, I've got money, what do you guys want me to get for you? This is a great place to go to kind of build that up and get more diverse um, literature into your classrooms. We also like the idea of the tips for teachers on teaching Native American issues. So this is like, how do you address things? What kind of um, ideas and words and things do you need to be aware of so as not to cause maybe more trauma or make things difficult for your Native students? Um, and I think that's a really great way to understand and get some of that perspective. There also is a Native American Heritage Month, which has resources from all of the national, all of those things listed below, which is another great place to go. And then I also like the article that I put in there for your own reading, which is what every teacher should know to teach Native American students. And so again, these are articles written by natives for us that if you're not native, this gives you that idea of where you're coming from. So that way you can educate yourself as well. All right, last inquiry that we are going to do is what's called a QFT technique or the question formulation technique. And so this we're going to just do in the chat with you. And I have gotten this particular image. I just went out to the Library of Congress and I just searched on immigrants slash loc.gov. And that's how I, I found this. So if you can go to the next slide. So for question number for the QFT or the question formulation technique, the first thing is you take an image or it can be a document, it can be a recording, it can be an audio, it can be any primary source. And so in this case, I did an image because it works for this presentation, but you just want to produce questions. So in the chat, I just want you to come up with as many questions as you can. And this is what you would do with your kids. You would take obviously a little bit more time with it. You don't stop to judge or discuss or answer any questions. All you're doing is coming up with questions. You write down every single question that the kids come up with. And if kids have a statement, you make them change that statement to a question. So um, why are there a lot of people on the ship? How many people? Where are they coming from? Where are they going? Why is everyone standing on deck? Good. Where's the boat coming from? What time period? 
great. How many people are there? When did this happen? Why is it so crowded? That's a good one. <laughs> Perfect. What are they leaving? Oh, I like that one. Are there enough lifeboats for all the people? Great question. What time of year is it? So these are all great questions. When is this happening? Are there any bathrooms? <laughs> yes, that's, that's another funny. Thing. That's, Kids yeah, will ask it. Oh, Kids yeah, will ask know. it. Yep. How long did they travel? Oh, who took the picture? How does a ship hold them all? These are great. What languages? Ooh, I like that one. What languages do they speak? That's great. What kind of boat is it? Perfect. So you see the idea, right? Is that you want kids to just generate the questions because it's not so much that we want to give them the questions, right? It gets to that first Sam Weinberg quote. We want to give them the tools to solve those problems. And part of that is encouraging that curiosity, right? And encouraging their questions. And that's one thing that I really like about this technique is it puts the onus on our kids. They're the ones that are coming up with the questions, not you. Um, and so that's great. Why are women wearing, um, wearing on their heads? That's perfect. So then step two is improving the questions. And so this you can do in small groups, you can do it in pairs, um, but you want to have the kids improve their questions, right? Some questions are better than others. They can also categorize their questions into open-ended questions that don't necessarily have an exact meaning and closed-ended questions, which do have an exact specific answer. And it's not that open-ended or closed-ended questions are right or wrong, because closed-ended questions can definitely lead to evidence and investigation. Um, so you want both, right? And you want kids also to practice taking the closed-ended question and make it an open-ended question where it doesn't have a specific answer and taking an open-ended question and making it a closed-ended question. So have them categorize it in that way. You can also have them list advantages and disadvantages to both. Like, will this question lead to more investigation? Will it lead to more inquiry and more answers? Um, and have them change kind of that question, question type with that. Then step number three is to strategize the questions. And so this you can maybe do as a whole group. You could do this if you were online, you could do this maybe in like a Google slide or something where the kids are typing in their questions or circling the three most important questions, which again, when you think about the standards that we're using, right? As the kids are evaluating these questions, as they're prioritizing them, hey, this is the most important question. This is second. This is third. Again, they're really getting those disciplinary skills and processes in, and they're practicing them a lot. Um, what was the reason for selecting those questions? Um, and then also helping students to research and prep for some kind of final assessment. Oops. Ah. And then lastly, step four in the question formulation technique is reflecting. So this is where you create some kind of action plan or discuss, discuss a next project. Maybe it's the project that you have um, as a whole, right? Whatever this may be a, a piece of. Um, one thing I've, I've seen teachers do, which is really great, is think of the question formulation technique, maybe for a whole unit, where maybe you introduce something at the beginning and you have kids come up with a whole bunch of questions, put them on like sticky notes and put them around the room or in a certain place in the room. And then as you answer those questions in the course of the unit, the kids move their sticky note to the answered, um, answered section. And so again, it's the idea of getting those kids interested in um, the questions, coming up with questions and really evaluating, hey, what makes a good question? What do we maybe need to tweak to be more specific? Um, getting that practice in that investigation and that research with it. Next slide. So that's the last um, inquiry that we're going to show you for today. But again, like Tammy had said earlier, right, there is no right or wrong way to do inquiry. There are lots of different ways to do inquiry. We've just shown you three methods that we feel have a very high return on your investment, right? You're going to get a lot of standards with that. In addition to the link for the um, Native American children's literature, we also wanted to point out the notable books. And so this is done through the National Council for Social Studies with the Children's Book um, Organization. And what they do every year is they go through trade books 
for social studies and determine what are good books and, and what, what are ones that definitely you should take note of. They do this every year. If you are a member of NCSS, you can actually go back and search the database for past um, books. But this is a great thing for you if you want to um, buy books for your library, if you have that ability to, or if your librarian has a fund that they're like as your um, grade level, you can say, hey, these are the books we want to get. And so these were just some of the books that I pulled up that are fantastic, would be great for fifth grade that were vetted from this organization as really good children's books. And so you've got things on the constitution, you've got stuff on uh, you know the expansion out west, you've got ideas on slavery, you've got also ideas on immigration, like Near Pi is a great one and the Arabic quilt is another one. Again, talking about immigrants today, right? Um, you've also got all different kinds of ones. So there are lots of them, I definitely recommend uh, taking the time to go back and, and look at them. And then the last thing we just want to address is this idea of how do you teach social studies in ELA in an already packed uh, classroom. And so we do have separate um, trainings and webinars on these that get a little bit more into detail, but we just wanted to address what kind of Tammy and I have come up with as our, our best suggestions for doing this quickly and easily. So first is kind of reviewing your current reading series and curriculum for social studies connections. So as you look at the books you're already reading, what content in those stories already meets social studies standards? Like things like, oh, this has got some stuff talking about immigration, we can bring in that history into it. Um, and then where there are gaps, that's when you go and you find maybe some econ lessons or something of that nature that you need to fill the gap in. Um, and those gaps you can use for anything. Like I said, we're gonna show you the Library of Congress teaching with primary resources. Again, these are all linked on here already. Um, the National Archives has great links as well as resources for you with guided um, uh, questions for to do like that observe, reflect and question kind of thing. Um, yeah, Common Lit is another great one that does it that will adjust um, Lexile levels Newzella is a paid source. They do have some free items on there. Um, Readworks as well. And then just make taking the time that when you create your units, again, get into this idea that Shanahan says of eliminating the, the block, right? We want ELA and social studies to be taught together. And in doing that, you will get more um, consistent, better writing responses from your kids. They're building that background knowledge. And so aligning those standards where it's like, hey, we've done these 10 standards in ELA, we're also doing this. And we'll show you where at the end, we'll show you a bunch of websites. And then use inquiries and lessons and fill those gaps as often as you can. So with that, we're going to stop now. We'll come back to, if you want to stop sharing, Tammy, because we'll come back and show you a bunch of our screen uh, websites. And we're going to turn the remainder of the time over to uh, Heather and the Arizona Geographic Alliance. All righty. Hi, everybody. Um, I am going to, as I said, we're the Arizona Geographic Alliance, and I'm going to show you a few lessons that we have on our website, ready-made lessons that you can take into your classroom. Now, in no way do you need to do these lessons in their entirety. Our lessons are designed for you to take bits and pieces of them, do the whole thing as you like, scale it up, scale it down. It all depends on what you would like to do. So before I do that, though, I kind of want to gauge your familiarity with the Arizona Geographic Alliance. So Linda, if you could put up that poll that you made. And so if you could take a moment to answer Should those questions. I need about 88% of you voted. This is secretly the test to see if you're all still awake. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll end the polling. It looks like everybody answered and share the results. Perfect. So it looks like about 69% um, of you have not heard of us. So this is exciting because I like being able to show the Arizona Geographic Alliance to new people, um, which means a lot of you as well have not used the lesson and that Pretty nice little 
mesh there of who has taught fifth grade and who hasn't taught fifth grade. So pretty excited about that. So what I want to do, as I said, is I'm going to show a few lessons and you can take them, you can leave them, whatever works for you. So um, let me share my screen. We're going to play the technology game. I have to start. All righty. Do you see the normal slide view, not my notes? No, it's your notes one. Of course. Let me switch it. There we go. Now you should just oh see the slide view. Um, no. Still only the. Still just the notes, yeah. Okay. Let me try a different share. Let's try. How about now? What do you see? It's zoomed in on you, interestingly enough, but I don't on see. Me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, how about now? I'm not seeing anything. Oh, there we go. Um, I just see the slide show. Regular? Good. No, I see all this. Okay. It's the before you put it in presentation mode. Uh oh. Oh, before. Um, oh, Heather, all you have to do is hit um, play from start. And I did that. Oh, you did, and it didn't work. Yeah. What What do you guys see now? Do you see it? Yes. Now we see it. On? Yay! There we go. Perfect. Now. Wait, wait. What do you see now? Uh, showcasing see... grade five, United States right, studies. Do you see it as I'm doing it as a PowerPoint it's, or do you see it's it a PowerPoint. as I'm perfect, working yeah. on it? It's working. It's, it's perfect now. It's full okay, screen. I'm not, full screen. Gonna, I'm not gonna touch it. Oh, no, no, you just touched it. I didn't, I think it's confused. I'm so sorry. We all love technology, don't we? Yes. Yeah, yeah it just tried one to more the... thing. It just went back. Okay, I tried one more thing. We'll see what happens. I think there's a delay. Oh, it went a little bit bigger, but. Okay. Well, I'll get started. Is If you can see stuff, awesome. Tam, uh, Tammy and Linda will be sharing this with you. <laughs> so you'll be able to get all the links and everything. Do we see anything now? Yeah, we see your slide. It's in the, it's not the presentation mode though. If you close the, oh, oh yeah, now, now it, it is. is. Perfect. Okay. Not touch it. <laughs> Don't touch it. <laughs> Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Okay. Nope. Thank you guys. I apologize for that chaos and confusion. So as I said, I am here to show you a few lessons and hopefully when I switch slides, it will happily switch slides for me. Um, and so I'm just going to go through a few of them and then I'm going to have you guys interact a little bit and see what we can help you take back to your classroom based on a lot of the stuff you've heard today combining English language arts, combining geography with all of these subjects, whether it's the reading, the math, the science, we know it's hard. We know you don't get ample amount of time to do everything and anything when you're teaching. So we've worked to put geography in everything, whether it be PE, whether it be arts, whether it be pure social studies. So that is what we're hoping that you can take away from these few lessons that we're, I'm gonna show you here. So the very first thing to understand is this is the grade level where students should start understanding the five themes of geography. And the five themes of geography are, are fairly simple, but they can be so enriching and allow for you to teach so many different things with these five themes of geography. So the five themes are location, place, human environmental interaction, movement, and region. And you can have an entire, I could spend hours just on movement, talking about, you know, trains, planes, automobiles, social media, the way, you know, news travels so fast now. I mean, think about it. When's the last time you got a, a written letter in the mail and, and different aspects of that. Human environmental interaction. A lot of us right now are indoors because Arizona is, it's only hundred degrees outside at 1030 in the morning. I know some of you go walking in the morning. We, we talk about if we have animals, we don't want to put them outside. We, we put little booties on their feet if they're, so they can walk. We're 
adapting to that environment. Place, the different physical and human characteristics. Location, an absolute and exact address. You live here. Or how about the relative location? I always tell the story of my mom and dad went to visit my cousin back in New Hampshire. And she's like, yeah, just turn left at the red barn. She's from Arizona, so I'll give her that. But when they got there, there was about 17 red barns. <laughs> and so you have that relative where you give those directions. The kids aren't, they're young enough that they're gonna say, yeah, I live by you know, the McDonald's or I live by the library or I live across the street from the school. And then you have regions, which again, look at those physical and human characteristics. So the lessons you're gonna see today build upon those five themes of geography and allow you to integrate this all throughout your curriculum to build upon it as they go. So this first lesson is, I don't have an author on this lesson. All of our lessons are created by teachers out in the field and are posted on our website. We have about 450 of them posted. Thankfully, our retired core coordinator didn't, she wanted a, a job in her retirement and she was able to revamp all of our lessons with the new standards that um, they were discussing. So this lesson, I don't have an author on there, but that's because it was written by a group of teacher consultants. And so this lesson should follow when you start talking about what is geography. And we have some slides in this lesson that can help you teach what is geography, but you want the students to recall that definition of geography, that it's not just maps, that it allows them to look at things spatially. And a lot of times people say, oh, you're studying geography? You love maps, don't you? Well, yeah, I love maps, but there's a lot of other stuff that I love about geography as well. So you can distribute this five themes of geography um, graphic organizer and any of the images you see up here that look like worksheets or graphic organizers are all built into the lessons and are there PDF for you to use. And I'm gonna show my website at the end of this session and you'll be able to access all, everything I show you today. No sign in required, they're all just there for you. So you're gonna instruct those students when you go over the five themes to put notes. So in human environmental interaction, they would write, you know, how humans work with the environment to stay cool or work with the environment to put a, a roof over their heads. Maybe they'll talk about those movements where planes and trains and everything like that. So they have that different aspect of those five themes. Well, we don't just wanna, you know, lecture at them. We want them to do something fun and look at those five themes. So what, Next step, the students, and this may take a little bit of back information from you. And I don't know the travelers out there. I was one of those travelers that wherever I went, I had to buy a, book, a postcard. And postcards are hard to find now. So you may have to ask around, but what you're gonna wanna have around is a variety of postcards. And I don't encourage teachers to spend money, but if you can have, you know, if there's a fund at, at school, there is a way on, I saw on Amazon that you can buy a set of postcards that are random. So I don't know if somebody has gone out to the world and gotten postcards and says, let me just put them together. But this picture you see up here is actually from the sale on Amazon where you could buy a grouping of postcards for a few dollars. So it's up to you. Um, I know like my in-laws go anywhere, they buy postcards. You can always give it a couple of years to do that. But you wanna give the kids um, about 10 postcards each, and then you want them to look at the postcards and try identifying what theme it's showing. So maybe if it's got a city, you could talk about you know, a region, or if it's got you know, a city that's showing you the trains that are going through, you can talk about that movement. Um, you can talk about physical, if you've got the one you see of um, the Grand Canyon, different aspects so they look at these pictures and so if you can't get postcards you can always pull up some pictures of what the five themes represent what is what are we looking at on these postcards and why are they you know why does new york put the statue of liberty on their postcard why does texas have you know a rancher lassoing a, a bull so you have those different discussions and, and they work in a group to figure out what that main theme is and then they can share out with the class. We thought this postcard was this theme. This postcard was, was that theme. And once they've done that, they're actually then gonna create their own postcards. And so they'll need 
to look at five blank index cards because there's five different themes. And so I have an example up here. If I'm going to make postcards based on those five themes, they're going to start on one side is going to be the picture. And then on the back would be the written word, the addressing of the postcard. So they're going to draw maybe the Grand Canyon or a cactus or a bunch of cacti. Um, they're going to maybe do a map showing latitude and longitude or showing where they live. Maybe they do a map of their school and they show your classroom. They show a map of the Southwest or the Sonoran Desert. That would be a region, human environment, interaction. Somebody's drinking water, they're skiing, they're swimming or movement, drawing people coming through those major highways. You know, um, a lot of talk about backpacking through the country, hiking, going on those trips. So they're drawing those pictures and on the back, they're gonna look at a sentence or two about what they're seeing and what they're identifying being sent to a friend. And then they'll learn to address the card properly. Maybe they can mail it to themselves if you got, you know, your school wants to mail them out. That would be pretty cool. And then of course you can always display them. Maybe you got an open house coming up. You can display them, make a nice room, room display. After they do that, they can um, then share out their postcards. And then this is the guidelines that you see here is, is written into the lesson plan, showing them how to address, giving those couple sentences. And it gives you a scoring guide. As a teacher, you can score them or you can score them however you want. And then um, there is a, a quiz that goes along in this lesson if you'd like to do. And then this is something, I did this one first because I want you to see that you can refer back to this. If you wanna make a five themes wall in your classroom, you can refer back to these themes as you go through the school year. So my question for you in the chat, I gotta find the chat. <laughs> and please be honest, I love honesty. So if you think you'd use any part of this lesson, please put yes in the chat. If not, no, or maybe you're still thinking about it, whatever works for you. Yay, I love to see all the yeses. But again, if you can't find postcards, maybe you have a secret collection hiding somewhere. Um, you can always use images. You can ask around, see if anybody's got postcards. It used to be a lot easier. I went to one in Tombstone and the gentleman was like, oh, we don't sell postcards anymore. I was like, what? Perfect. Awesome, sweet. Let me show you the next one then. You know, we're short on time. So by going too fast, I apologize. Just make sure I get everything. So Cookie Monster. All righty, this one used to be a lot easier with co new COVID rules. It might depend upon what your school district allows you to do. Um, but this is applying those five themes of geography and it does involve a cookie. So if you're not willing to give your kids a cookie, I understand. But um, this is gonna look at them mapping something that isn't a normal map. So maps are a human representation of a space. And I love maps, yes, because I'm a geographer, but I love maps because I always would show the kids a map of London. And I know fifth grade is not is about the US. But when I taught about maps, I would show them a map of London, but it wasn't a normal map. It was a map in the shape of the queen. And it was like, people can draw their own interpretation of what you're seeing. And it shows that maps don't just have to be an exact representation. So, but the looking at maps, we still need to make sure as cartographers, as geographers, they're using the essential components so it's easy to read. When I showed them that map of London, they're like, well, what am I reading? And then you show them a real map and you're like, oh, okay, this is why we have to standardize some of the aspects. So this actually looks at the idea, and, and I this book is cute, and I don't expect you to read it to your fifth graders. Have any of you actually heard of this book? Do you give a mouse a cookie? It's so cute, I love this. You give him a cookie, he's gonna want a glass of milk, he wants a glass of milk, he wants a straw. So it's based on that, okay, what if I give a geographer a cookie? What are they gonna do? Well, they're gonna map it, because that's what we do. We love mapping. 
So what it does is it, you have to review prior knowledge with them thinking of dog sales. And if you haven't done our dog sales lesson, it's one of our, our well-known lessons that takes the standard parts of a map and identifies them. So you're looking at the date, the orientation, um, the grid, the scale, the title, all of those aspects on a map so that the kids will hopefully use that. I did teach high school science for a while and I know the hardest thing is when I wanted them to do a graph or wanted them to do a chart was getting them to label everything. And so by labeling and showing them the good parts of a map, it helps to reinforce those ideas. So you're gonna distribute the thinking like a geographer mapping a cookie worksheet. And that's where they're gonna look at this cookie. And so they're actually gonna receive a cookie. So you'd have to get cookies for your kiddos and they're gonna map their cookie. And of course, day and age, they got cell phones, they can take a picture if they don't finish it and take it home. But here is the worksheet that you go with, with the cookies. So it depends on what kind of cookies you give them, but they're gonna look, look at the cookie and they're actually, they can trace it if they want onto their map or they can enlarge it. They wanna develop a scale or looking at it. Maybe they wanna draw a little bigger than it is. And they're gonna look at the spatial aspects. So maybe you don't give them cookies that are perfectly round. <laughs> My, my aunt is, is queen of making sugar cookies in shapes that are never wrapped. And so you, you have these different types of, hey, what it looks like, what, what, how are you drawing it? And then they actually catch the chips, the intation, the ass of that cook. We're gonna replicate it on map flat because then they start dusting hey, what those, you know, chips and chocolate chip cookie represents, okay? What would it, you know, could this be, you know, the, the buildings in your city? Could this be, you know, the pathways between the cookies? So it gets them kind of looking at, well, how do I map that? How do I look at that? Then they can create this alphanumeric grid and put it into quadrants. If you want to look at the different quadrants, they can make a scale. How far does it take me to travel from one chocolate chip to the other chocolate chip? And then they can look at the different aspects. Do they have a title? Do they have a date? Do they have the author? And then they can give absolute location. So they're located. My biggest chocolate chip is located in grid C4. And so it kind of looking through that aspect of the cookie and then it explores maps in a different way. They don't just have to look at, you know, all the maps or the political or the historical maps. They can look at a map of their cookie. And then if you're one of those teachers, you can let them eat the cookie when they're done. <laughs> depending on how much they've destroyed it. So questions about that? Perfect. If you can have cookies in your classroom or in titles to do this, I always love destroying my classroom. It's the fun part of teaching. Would you use this? Yes or no? Don't be shy. Nice. Perfect. Love to hear that. Love it, love it, love it. Yes, you can connect it to math, definitely. You count how many, why, why does, you know, Tammy have more chocolate chips than I do? <laughs> Perfect, cool. I will go on to the next one then. Still seeing everything okay? I haven't heard me see anything, so good. Okay, this one is about scrambling the states to practice math reading and identifying characteristics of different states. So in this lesson, students will use political maps to give directions and physical maps to kind of get some information about their states. I was gonna show you the video, but I'm scared to adjust my screens <laughs> given the situation. So there is a YouTube video based on this book. Uh, I do a background on, so it's probably not gonna show me, but you can see the picture there. And this book is amazing in the aspect that the video linked in the lesson is a YouTube video of a gentleman reading the book, but he's given all the state's personalities. So it's not just you as a teacher reading it, but he actually, you know, Texas has that Texas accent, you know, back East has the, that, that draw where they say wash. And so you get that kind of, it gets a little bit more into the story, but this story is about Kansas who is very, very sad and doesn't want to be where he's at anymore. So he wants to move. 
<laughs> he's kind of stuck. And so this book has fantastic images that show you all the different states and they all decide they're going to move and they're not going to be the United States of America anymore. They're going to be the scrambled states of America. And they go through this and they're like, but Florida, you know, moves up and they're freezing because they're not used to the cold. California is like, where's my earthquakes? <laughs> and the state that moves to California is like, what's all this rumbling? And they even have a love story. Nevada and Mississippi fall in love. And then what happens when they all go back to normal? They have to move away and they miss each other. So it's a fabulous little story that talks about all those states where they, they go from being this scrambled mess of, of people to that kind of, they're back to normal. They miss what they had, what, what they examined. So I do apologize that I cannot show this video, but there is that YouTube video. It'll be linked and it's linked in the lesson that allows you to hear. And the gentleman does fabulous voices to go with each of the states. But you're gonna read aloud this book or show the video. And we have these two maps that go with this lesson and it looks at those different states and where you're moving them and where you're putting it. And you wanna encourage, because the students after you read this book, they're gonna move two states. They're gonna look at the characteristics of two states and you kinda wanna encourage them to do ones that are far away. You don't really wanna do Nevada and California. You wanna do like Arizona and Minnesota. And I can say that from experience because I was a born in Arizona, moved to Minnesota, froze to death, <laughs> moved back. So you have those different aspects of it. So you want to try and encourage the kiddos to do as far away as possible to get those different characteristics. So you're going to read it, read this book aloud or show the video. And you're going to have the students scramble them states themselves by picking two states and, and swapping them, moving them around. And then they're going to identify, okay, what path would the, the um, state take to get to its new home. So what states does it have to go through? What cardinal directions? Saying, for example, if I'm moving Oregon and I'm gonna move Oregon with Florida, I'm gonna say, well, Oregon initially needs to move east through Idaho, Wyoming, and then eventually south to get all the way down to Florida. And what you have them do is they write those directions and then you have them swap with a fellow student. And the fellow student looks to see if they can follow those directions. I taught robotics and science Olympiad and the hardest thing was following directions <laughs> and writing them precisely. There's actually, if any of you do science and, and talk to your high school science teacher friends, there's science Olympiad where you actually have to write out directions on how to do something, the kiddos switch it. And then the only way you win that competition is if they can follow it. So writing directions, even at my age is so hard. And so this gives the kiddos a chance to say, okay, how is Oregon going to take that trip? It can be the, you know, the AAA map quest, make it go what direction that needs to go. Then what they're going to do is they're going to look at the characteristics of those states. So they have this worksheet that they're going to examine the climate, the vegetation, and the natural hazards of that state beforehand. Then they're going to look at the state after. You know, I talked about, you know, if California is, or I'm sorry, Florida is going to move to Minnesota, Florida is suddenly going to be cold. It's not going to have those same vegetation that it used to. Those palm trees aren't going to survive in the snow. So they examine the before and after effects of where they're living. Now, lots of, I'm warning you, this is like, PowerPoint don't do. The next slide has tons of words on it. And I only put this on here because I want to show you. This is one of those lessons that has an extension. Some of our lessons, the, the teacher want to do great ideas. And so we made them extensions, stuff that you can add. So as I said, lots of words. I apologize. But there's, after they've examined the characteristics of the different states, after they've moved them, they can take it a step further. If I got any art teachers, people that love to do art, I do stick figures. So not so good. But they can draw this you know cartoon of their state like the book portrays they can add the you know that personality of the state maybe they can write a poem or a journal entry of their path their their, their trail that they take or write a non-fiction report an essay maybe they draw postcards like you had them do with the previous lesson 
or if you want them to do, you know, more detailed research, they can look at the state symbols, the wildlife and climate, human features or state histories. So I wanted to put all of this up here because I want you to see that there is more. And as the teacher, you can pick and choose what you want them to do from this lesson and, and learning about all those different states. So, you know the question already, <laughs> would you use this lesson? And I really got to see that PB and J sandwich because I always forget to open the jar of peanut butter. <laughs> I always forget that step. Wonderful, I love seeing all this. Please don't be shy. If you don't like it, feelings will not be hurt. But I love including all the aspects where they get to write, they get to explore, they get to read. Perfect. Yes, teaching directions, still so hard. I had a girlfriend who's a pilot. She is horrible on land. <laughs> if I could have flown her over ASU our first year of college and showed her how to get to her classes, she would have been golden. But on the ground, she doesn't know which way to go. Yes, definitely depending on time. So that's why I stress, please take what you can. If you can't do the whole lesson, do what you can. Perfect, perfect. Alrighty, my next one is creating a city. So actually, we, we step them up a little bit, full on geography, urban planning experience. And so this is going to allow them to see how cities are created. And they're gonna work in that cooperative groups that we talked about to design that ideal city, one that's convenient for humans, preserves that environment and maintains a quality of life for both animals and humans. So they're not only gonna design the city, we're really good at designing, but we're gonna explain why this is good. Why this is, you know, why, why did the city start building in this direction? Why did this, this city, you know, move out here? Arizona, we're really good at that. How many freeways have been developed over the years because we keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger? And so you have those different aspects. And so this image you see is, is the Creative City worksheet that they're gonna be using. But first they're gonna talk with their group. They're gonna use those geography skills that you've taught them to look at their human environmental interaction. I mean, do you live by the freeway because it's easy access? Do you live by a park because you, you want the greenery? So they're gonna have this formal communication and we kind of that aspect of you're gonna hire your students. They're gonna be those you know, urban planners that get to figure out how to make this city and the town council needs their help and they need their help to figure out the best way to make this new town or this new city. And once they write, create their city, they're gonna write that formal communication to the town council to figure out if they're the hired group, they're the group that's gonna get the job and build their city. And they're gonna have that as a persuasive presentation. Why yours is the best? Why should we do that? And so, you as teacher with the class discuss the growth of Arizona. Have them list observations that they have noticed concerning the growth of their community. I do, maybe if you live in a small town in Arizona, maybe they see you know grocery stores popped up. Maybe there's more than one post office. Maybe there's a community college. Maybe there's another fire department. Remember when my brother moved out, outside Gilbert, he didn't have a fire department nearby. Ended up having one built right down from his house. Maybe there's another golf course. Maybe the golf course has been converted to, you know, apartment complexes, so many apartment complexes. And so you have this different aspect of things building up. There's a new restaurant or the restaurants have closed. Now that discussion, they can look at the positive aspects of growth versus the negative aspects of growth. And they can um, take their original list and put it in positive or negative. And then you can discuss how, what geographers do. They, they help plan these cities. So you're gonna divide the students into groups. They're gonna look at these vocabulary cards to figure out you know, what's, where things need to go. And then the best part of this is they get to create. So they take these images, they take the images and they can cut them out and then they can glue them on construction paper. Or if you digitize it, we haven't digitized yet. That'd be a cool thing to do but you can make them move around and create this to display their new city. A couple of student examples here. And yes, exactly like Tammy said, if you're doing a story and you combine it into 
the expansion. Why are they putting the government offices here? Why are they putting aspects of the, the city? Why is there a school next to the library? Is there a school? Is there a one school room house? Because it's really small. But they create these cities and then they have persuasive speeches. So they look at their city and they organize those, those aspects of it. And then they write their persuasive speech. Maybe this is something you can pull your admin in on. Your admin can be the town council and they can decide. Vote for that best plan. All righty. I had to put Phoenix on this slide because that's ours. Well, he's my city. Would you use this or parts of it? Perfect. He knows us. Yes, sis. Yes, different perspectives. Excellent. That is definitely. It creates that discussion. Well, why do you think the library needs to be here? Why do you think I should put it here? And then your persuasive speech, you have that passion. Well, the library needs to go next to here so the kiddos can view it. Wonderful. I love seeing these yeses. Oh, area near your school is changing. That's exciting. Yes and no, I know. <laughs> I went and visited. So I'm actually a graduate of Hamilton High School, the very first graduating class, which is scary. It's a long, long time ago. And I drove some of my students down to Hamilton for a competition. And I drove right past it, completely drove past Hamilton. And the kids were like, uh, it's back there. I was looking for the school with fields around it. Any of you in Chandler know that there are no fields around Hamilton High School anymore. <laughs> it's all built up. But I was like, oh, I missed the school because I was looking for open fields. So we definitely can experience this. All righty. Here's another lesson. Um, the difficulties of moving west. Now this one does take a book. Um, this book I will admit is out of print and please, please, please. Some people are, are not the brightest and they are selling it for like $350. Please do not buy it for $350. It is a very, very small book. <laughs> it is very small. It is very small pages. Please don't buy it for the outrageous price that they're selling it. I'm hopeful that some of your libraries will have it. If not, um, I'm working on getting some copies, which leaves me, I will be having Linda pick five names from the group of you and I will send you door prizes. So that might involve books, might involve some goodies. So we'll see, but I'm gonna send out some door prizes for you guys. So maybe this book will be one of those door prizes. Let's see how many copies I can find. Um, but this book is looking at the Oregon Trail, the stretching across the United States. And what's interesting about this book is it has different sections. So a lot of times we try and get the, oh, the whole entire thing. But what we do is we give them little bitty parts, kind of like a jigsaw, where they're then able to descri describe them. So you're actually gonna have six different groups and each group is gonna get a, a section out of this book. You're gonna discuss the vocabulary on page 40, which is words built into the lesson. There are some extra words in the lesson that give you those vocabs. And then they're gonna, look at going from Sydney, New York to Oregon City. And this map you see here is the map with the lesson that you can have them identify their portion, take notes on it and, and add to that aspect. So they're gonna read their, their um, section of the book and discuss it as well. Now, this lesson has English language learners accommodations in it as well. Um, if you want, you can pick whichever worksheet version works the best for your students. As you can see, the one on the left is more of every single chapter on one page, only gives rooms for words, doesn't give much space to write. But the one on the right is an adaptation of it that has areas for illustration, showing that cause and effect and that difficulty. So whatever you wanna do, both of these worksheets are provided in this lesson, but they're gonna look at the cause and effect. 
So what was the difficulty that they got through in that area? And it has personalized stories in this book, kind of gives them those, you know, we, we might, you know, we got stuck in the river, we had to go this way. And they're going to use their map of the United States, so tying again spatially into where they're at and why it's so different. Why are we suddenly in snow or why are we suddenly in heat or, or warmer areas? And they can look at that different and so they can draw in their route, in their red, and they can describe that, that section of where they're at. And then they're going to write a friendly letter at the end. So they've made it through their trip. They got through. They know those different cause and effects and what happens. And well, they're going to write home. They're going to write their friend from Sydney and tell them, oh, this was a crazy journey. You're never going to believe what I went through. I made a friend. And so they're able to use that information they just learned and create this friendly, lender, friendly letter that they're going to send. Questions. Alrighty, I love Oregon Trail video game too. Many, many hours doing that. Ooh, that could be an alternative book. Thank you, Tammy. We will look into it and see what we can do. So would you or would you not? If you can find the book, that's the caveat on this one. If you can, <laughs> you magically, the book appeared on your desk. <laughs> it's a National Geographic book as well. It Our is, West. but it's out of print. No, the, the Sergeant oh, the West one? is a National okay, Geographic perfect. book. Um, I have not um, read it, so I do not know if it's appropriate, but it's, it's still in print. And it actually has almost the same cover in a way. Okay. Oh, it's it by the same per oh, it's by the same person. He just, it's just an update. Okay, so maybe they have, that's why I can't find it, because it's yeah. an updated book. It's an updated book. It's called The Oregon Trail Adventures of Sarah Marshall. Okay, that's one of the stories, yeah. Persons in the books, yeah. So it, it, it might work. It might be, it might work, yeah. Sarah was the daughter, the 12 year old. Well, it, it talks about her family too. It's their experience okay. too. So um, yeah, it's probably and it's updated. At the hardcover is $5. Okay. Do you have that link? Can you put it in the chat for us? Um, I just went to Amazon. Um, okay. so let me see. It's so weird. The hardcover is only $5, but the paperback's 24. Um, I know it's crazy. I'm going to go ahead and put it in the chat. Thank you. Gotta love Google, right? You do. And I would put it up, but I'm scared. <laughs> no, no. I, I put it in the chat already. Perfect. Thank you for that. Yeah. It just Alrighty. I've got three more that I want to show you. I want to be aware of our time. So we'll go a little faster. Um, next one involves the Underground Railroad. Um, and this takes, you know, looking at character traits, looking at the different paths and understanding the Underground Railroad. And it shows those Harriet um, Tubman's characteristics that we hope that our students develop over time. And they're gonna learn about the Interland Railroad and what helped it be successful. So again, this is the example of the book that the author, John Halverson used, but he says you can use any book you want um, on her story. That's perfectly fine. Now, I know as a teacher, there were things I had to teach that I didn't know a lot about. And so I would always have to research or look into it beforehand. Um, to understand it enough or understand it so I could help the students. So in this is actually a background information for the teacher. So the paper you see on the left-hand side is for the teacher. If you need a refresher or any information, that is there for, for the teachers. It's not meant to go to the students. The one on the right, however, is the sheet that you start out with where you ask the students these questions. What is, what is, what, what is a railroad? Completely not related to what we're talking about. But what, what do they think is a railroad? And then what does it mean underground? And then what do you predict you think is an underground railroad? Then some of the code words, some of the words that they, they see as they, they go through this and examine this concept. Then you're gonna look at the characteristics that make a good person. 
talk about those characteristics. Look at it, what the importance are. How do we know if a person is trustworthy? How do we know if a person is responsible? And what's the example from the story? So you have those books, the story of her life. Use example, how, how was she, you know, show respect or cooperation? How did this work? Ooh, I like that one. Yes, that would be a good book too. So you can use these if you want for any aspects. Hopefully you can take them into your classroom for what you may have to read because I know there are sometimes required reading in, in different grade levels. So you can read it, identify those characteristics like I just said, and talk about them and explain what those characteristics are. Then of course, because we are geography, we have a map about the Underground Railroad, looking at the different paths that were taken, major routes, directions, you can talk about those, look at those identifying the map elements on the sheet, you know, the, the legend, the scale, how many miles did they travel? And then at the very end, as you see a theme, this one also has a writing assignment where they can write a story about a person who shows one or more of these character traits. What are we seeing? What are we learning? How do I portray those character traits? There is a video as well linked in this lesson that can explain the Underground Railroad. Again, don't want to switch my screen, so I'm not going to show it. <laughs> and I am running out of time. So now I apologize because I know it's, it's close to lunch, but my next two are going to involve food. But let me know first if you think you would use this or examine it more maybe because I did go pretty fast on that one. If you take a look at it. So go ahead and throw that in the chat. Wonderful, love seeing the S's. Definitely, love this. Thank you guys, thank you for feedback. Perfect. All right, so I'm apologizing now, talking about food. So if you're hungry, I apologize, because I'm hungry too. So the next two can be either, you can take parts of each, put together, whatever ends up um, working for you. But in this lesson, they're gonna look at agricultural products from the different regions of the US. So again, one of those main themes of geography, and they're gonna look at creating a lunch menu and looking at their lunch menu and wondering, okay, where's my food coming from? I know we have a person from Yuma. Thank you for all the agriculture that comes out of Yuma. We would not have what we have if it wasn't for Yuma. So you get to look at those different aspects of agriculture. So you start the class. And we'll do this. We got to uh, give a minute to this. So let me ask you this. What's your favorite food? One thing. Pizza. Hamburgers. Go ahead and put it in chat. Steak. Oh, I'm hungry. Tacos. Ooh, avocado. Steak. Cookies. Somebody said steak. So everybody's like, I want steak now. Lasagna. I love pasta. Pizza. Right? I know. It's hard. You want all of it. <laughs> Lobster, ooh, somebody's from back east or by the ocean. Bacon, bread. I think a lot of people are going to either have tacos, steak, <laughs> pizza for dinner. Strawberries, right. where do they grow those? So as you can see by my example, I've got orange juice. We know the most, the state that produces the most orange juice is Florida. So they're going to identify Florida on the map. They're going to identify which region of the map. And we look at, okay, that's gonna be, you know, the Southeast region of the United States. And you can go with a step further. Um, anybody that's eaten at Five Guys, they always put up on the board where their potatoes are from, right? Which part of the country they, they're getting their potatoes from. So you have all these different, you can talk them through different food. Of course, kids are gonna love it because they're gonna be hungry. So what you do then is you break them into groups. And they're gonna take notes actually on their maps. And what they would be doing is identifying different foods. So there's all these different readings and I only put two on because I didn't want to bog down the screen, but there's different readings based on each region. And when they're looking in each region, they're gonna take notes on what is there and they're actually gonna take notes on their map. And so each group is gonna be like, you have a Southeast group that's gonna look at the food that comes from there. They're gonna look at you know what farms exist. Um, the pecan farm down at 
south of Tucson. There's these different aspects of what comes from each of those. And so these readings are built into the website. And then you're going to look at all of them as a group, as a class and decide, okay, you know, where do we get from the West? What do we have, you know, fish and lobsters and crabs, right? In the Midwest, we have this milk, cheese and ice creams, all the different factories that you can go visit and see how it's made. And then you're gonna look at a school lunch, whether it's just your typical school lunch menu, the example we give, or maybe you go to the cafeteria and borrow the school lunch. And they can look at and discuss breaking down those major ingredients and where they could potentially come from and talking about you know where they're gonna get their food supply from. And then they're going to create in their groups an original lunch menu representing all five regions that exist from that area. And as you can see, there's the two worksheets they're gonna look through. What's the menu item? What's the ingredients in that menu item? And then where are those items from? So they can split it up and figure out, okay, where are the peaches coming from? Where the oranges are coming from? And they can use their map that has the notes on it to do that. All right, for time's sake, you can give me an invisible thumbs up or thumbs down. So I wanna tie this into our next lesson, but our next lesson takes it a step further. So not are you only just looking at the um, lunch menu, you're looking at grocery stores and supermarkets. And, and this actually ties into math because you're gonna have the students figure out the cost and looking at how much it would be to create that item or to spend on that item. So same thing, this is why I said they kind of tie together because you use the same readings to identify the food in each region. Okay, do you know where this food comes from? Do you know, you know the lettuce in Yuma? We'd be hungry without it. Looking at those five different regions. Then this time you're actually gonna use grocery ads. And I had to put the Smitty's ad up there because I don't remember, and it's hard to see the date on there, but this is September 27th from something. I'll have to look further into this one, but look, ground beef was 87 cents. I don't know the last time I purchased ground beef for 87 cents. Bacon, 99 cents, does not happen. So you have all these different ads where you can pull them out. Maybe you get them at home, you can bring them in the classroom, but they're gonna look through the ads and they're gonna find some food and figure out then what they're looking for. So they're actually gonna create kind of a poster for their region. And on the back of that poster, they're gonna do some math problems. They're gonna create the math problems. And they're gonna say, okay, maybe if the beef steak sells for 5.99 a pound, what would six pounds cost? And they're gonna create these questions and then they're gonna exchange them with a group and they're gonna answer those questions. So not only are they examining what food comes from each region, they're looking at um, the cost of it and creating those math problems to figure out how much it would cost for me to you know, create that steak dinner. Alrighty, and then there's an assessment if you'd like, they can do that math as well. You've got your menu or your ad and they can figure out how much it would be. So last lesson, I apologize, I went through these fast, we are running low on time. But would you use any one of these supermarket sweeps or lunch menu food ones in your classroom? Maybe tie it in. So many yeses, I love it. Good, good. Maybe, see, thank you, honesty, I love it. No worries, I went through it pretty fast. Understood, if you don't have the time, that's cool. Maybe if you're doing a couple math problems, you could have them look at an ad. It doesn't have to be the full entirety of the lesson. Perfect, Alrighty. What I wanna show you real quick is how easy it is to access these lessons. So I've given you some of the titles. So on our website, which I will put up here in a moment, is these two lists. So each grade level has um, its own set of lessons. And what we've done is we've created what we call lesson lists. And these lesson lists take the geography standards that are in the social science standards and these are all the lessons that can teach that standard. And so you can see they are hyperlinks. 
I am going to switch sharing screens to my website real quick. Hopefully I don't break it. Um, and those lesson lists are out there for you to use. So again, our website, here's the link in chat, is um, very easy to, to access. But if you go to that website, that's where all these lessons are. Hopefully you can see this website. Here's our website. If you go over here on the right-hand side, second to bottom, lesson list by grade level, go to fifth grade. That is the page I was just showing you on that PowerPoint. Let's say, oh, I've got to teach, you know, standard 5.G3.1, examining human population and movement. You have those lessons and all of these lessons hyperlink to the lesson plan page here. Each lesson plan page has the teacher instructions, which open up into a PDF showing you those standards, not just the geography standards, but if there's history standards, if there's ELA standards, and then also here, your student materials, all those worksheets I showed you, and any of those lessons that you did, you are going to be able to search for. So if you go to the search button, you can type in. Now we're not Google, so we're not perfect search. Less words are probably better, but if you probably put lunch, you're gonna get the lunch ones. And so you can search for those in there. Um, and then if you just want maps, we have pages and pages of maps here for your use. Maybe some Arizona, you can have some cities with a compass rose, whatever you need for geography are up there. If you're having issues finding something, please just email me and let me know. But that is our resources and hopefully you will be able to um, see there. Heather, we've, Sorry. Had a, we've had a few questions. Um, people aren't sure where you found the lesson lists. Perfect, I will bring it up again. Okay. So if you look just on the home page, if you go back to our main link on the right side, it says list, lesson list by grade level right here on the right side. It is also down here in the latest news, but it will always stay right here on the right side. And you can just click on lesson list and you get all of them. And then you can pick whatever grade you need. What I love about the lesson list, Heather, is you can hone in on, say you don't have a lot of time and you wanna teach movement, you can do it through um, one of the history standards and geography standards combined. Exactly. And I, I love that we decided to do these lists because it also helps Hey, what, what can I do for that exact standard? Great. So I'm going to go ahead and Linda, you're going to wrap it up, correct? So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. Yeah. Or do you want me to share my screen? Yeah. Real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and share your screen. Let's see here. All right. Um, so we talked about, we've just got a few minutes left, but we talked about some of the resources and websites out here that are um, available to, to you guys. So this is one of the ones with uh, teaching primary sources. So this is again, another grant through the Library of Congress that they have created all these primary source sets that you can go out to and they've already curated um, ideas for you based upon you know, different things like here, immigration and expansion. And there are different lessons that you can go out here for, search on them. So again, these are all hyperlinked in your presentation that you will get, but I just wanted to show you what they have. So here's immigration, uh, here's African-American history, is some stuff like the treatment of Blacks after the Civil War, that could be something that's useful. Um, and then Tammy had shown you the getting started with primary sources from the Library of Congress. So this is the great place where it kind of edges you through. If you haven't used primary sources before, you're not sure what they are, how to use them. There are some great things here about how to find the primary sources, um, doing distance learning with primary sources. I'm going to click here on the teacher's guide and analysis tool. So for the observe reflect question activity that Tammy first went over with you guys, um, it has got uh, all these different kinds of primary sources here. So no matter what primary source you use, they have created a guide on it. So say you wanna use a photograph, for example, you click on this and it has some guided questions for you to ask your kids. So for a photograph, what do you see? What do you notice first? Some of the same questions that Tammy said, but things like what is the physical setting? What other details can you see? 
Um, why do you think the image was made? Um, what do you think the audience for the image was? And then what do you wonder about? So there are these here on the Library of Congress as well um, for their primary source. And again, they've got it for sound recordings, oral histories, any kind of primary source that you may see and want to use political cartoons they've got out here for it. Um, we also have, which I like, the National Archive worksheets, which are great because, and I just put the link right there in the, sheet, in the, in the chat, they do the same thing. So they've got different ones for photographs, political cartoons, but I like that they also break it into early or emerging readers. If you have maybe a student that's reading at a below a fifth grade reading level, you might want to look at, say, the political cartoon analysis sheet for them. Um, or if you have like an English language learner, is nice because they break it down a little differently and it's a little bit more um, an easier Lexa level to read for those kids. But then you can give your other kids, um, for more intermediate students and better readers, you can give them this cartoon. So it's nice because it breaks it up and it gives you two different a way in which you can um, uh, differentiate based upon the kids' learning level. And then the last one that we wanted to show you here before we move to our site is the Econ Ed link. So this is the link here. I'll place that in the chat. So to fill those econ gaps, after you look at your reading system and um, curriculum and what um, you know, history is maybe missing or what econ may be missing, excuse me, you can come down here and at this website, you can just click on grades three through five. And I like this site as well because it also has resources, um, seminars, webinars that you can also use to educate yourself on certain concepts. If you're unfamiliar with econ, if you were like me and you never took an econ class in your life, and then all of a sudden you had to learn it because you had to teach it, you know, so this is a great place to go. But I like here on the left hand side, you can scroll over and just type in lesson and then click apply. And what it does is it will start to now just take you to lessons strictly just the lessons that you can use. So this can be all about competition, like with pizza, where does your pencil come from? Um, this would be, again, they're not tied to history, so they don't, aren't really history related, but it would be a great way that you can fill that gap with a lesson and maybe you're tying it to science or tying it to ELA in another way. But there are all different ways to bring in lessons over here. And I've used these lessons myself personally, they have all of like the handouts and cutouts and readings and everything already prepared for you, much like the C3 teachers. And then last, we're gonna go to our website here. Um, I actually don't have it bookmarked for some reason, but we'll show you here. We'll put this in the chat as well for you, one last one. Um, so this is our website here. And so again, you have your standards at a glance where you can print out your standards here. We have here is our ELA and e, uh, social studies crosswalk. So if we come out here to show you what that looks like, so that way you can justify if you have to note the standards, you can say, oh, here are the social studies standards that mirror the ELA standard that also match the ELP standard, and then a rationale for how you can use those in the classroom. So that's all there for you um, as well. We also have a resource page here, which you can come out here for K-8. You click on fifth grade resources. So again, getting to that question earlier in the chat, like where do I find all of this stuff? Here we have our course consideration. So here's the content that you should be teaching in a fifth grade class. And then as you scroll down, it's all these different links with a rationale for how you can use them, what kind of primary sources, how it fits in with our fifth grade content for US history. So that's all there on that resource page. Um, we'll be we, updating things. Yes, and I will... and we do need to update those a little bit too. And then if we go back, I wanted to show you uh, professional development videos. So we have recorded webinars here. We will have the social studies webinar here with a slide deck that you can get. But there are also webinars here like on inquiry using reading scores to increase, um, increasing reading scores using literacy rich lessons. We also have just a generic one for K-6, how to use, how to use open education resources 
Um, so all of those are in there as well. And then there are little 10 minute bites too. And the last thing I wanted to show you on our website was our newsletter. So we do a newsletter every month from August through May. If you are not on our newsletter list, let me just show you kind of what the last one looked like. Um, it has all of the kinds of PD that we have available and coming up, not only through us, but through our partner organizations. Like for example, we have um, the EverFi um, Economics and Personal Finance for grades four through eight coming up next week, which would be a great session if you've got time for it. But it has all sorts of tips and tricks, latest pedagogy. It's got con um, contests for your students. It has teacher grants that you can sign up for. Um, as well as trainings, summer institutes that are available. So if you do not get our letter or you haven't submitted your name for it, um, I highly recommend you do that. And then the last thing we just need to do is just say thank you. So if you can type your first and last name into the chat, um, Heather's got a survey for you as well that you can do and we'll send that out with the email. Um, if you are interested in getting on our newsletter, put your email in as well as your first and last name. I will verify attendance. Typically, I have another session on media literacy this afternoon, so I probably won't get to it till tomorrow. But wait until you get an email from me at that point in time, then you know your attendance is completed. You may be prompted to complete a survey when you log into the system. And um, with that, we want to say <laughs> thank you so much for coming. I am going to stop recording here.